All right, guys, so we're here in Dalton's ass Jeep. We're going to hey, ass don't cheater. Don't on this. My professor's dog is gonna watch this. Um, I'm sorry if your professor's is watching this. Stop cussing! <laughs> So what are we looking for at the store today, Dalton? Uh, well, we're gonna be hey making guys. Japanese dumplings, <laughs> or also known as gyoza. Oh. Which I don't really say that word too often, so I probably just- Yowza! <laughs> Stop. It's all right, so we're getting ingredients to get dumplings. It's gonna be pretty legit. We did this one time before, right? It was uh, actually no, a good success. No, we did it multiple times before. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're experts pros. We have our own restaurant. You guys can check us out. We're all on the East Coast. We call ourselves the Dumpling Duo. Uh, we're also known as <laughs> Hunan Express. Yeah, he's, his name's Hunan. <laughs> My name's Kevin. <laughs> okay, Dakota. Yes. Dakota. Do you know where Japanese dumplings come from? You said Japanese dumplings. Yes, where do they come from? I'm gonna say Japan. Oh, that's a great intuition. <laughs> but where did the Japanese get the dumpling? I'm assuming you don't know where the dumpling comes from. I'm gonna say it's from definitely Asian culture. It's, it originated in China. And the Japanese got it from China after World War II, after returning home. Okay, so going back to the discussion, the Japanese got the dumplings from the Chinese and they basically took the recipe from the Chinese after World War II. Stop. I'm just doing your hand gestures. And the difference between the two, there really isn't a big difference. The Japanese typically fry their dumplings while the Chinese steam them. And Chinese dumplings typically have th thicker wrappers than the Japanese dumplings. <laughs> okay, but then that begs the question, where did the Chinese get the dumplings? Well, the Chinese invented the dumpling around the Han Dynasty in 200 AD to treat frostbitten ears. Ever since then, it's been like a typical dish you see during the Chinese New Year. So it's been around for, for many, many generations. Okay, you ready? So ready. All right, let's go let's get do this. Let's go get the ingredients. <laughs> Gonna go to Harris Teeter. <laughs> you gotta switch the camera back. No, it's okay. We no, got it. You can't We're at Harris Teeter. Look, no. it's Harris Teeter. You got Because it's fresh. Okay, so Harris Teeter didn't have everything, so now we gotta go to Wegmans. Oh, gosh, yeah. Done with Wego Maprego, and now we're out of here. Let's go make some dumplings! What are you doing? Seriously? Seriously? Doing all the heavy lifting here. In this recipe is Napa cabbage, and Napa cabbage is different from your ordinary like round cabbage that kind of looks like a iceberg lettuce. This is square. The leaves come up towards the top. It doesn't kind of roll into a ball. Napa cabbage and European cabbage, they're kind of like the same shape, same size. There's also different types of cabbages. You have cabbages like Brussels sprouts, and then you have uh, other cabbages like kale and collard greens, which look significantly different than this head. All right, we're gonna wash the cabbage. And after you give it a gentle rinse, you just wanna remove the outer leaves just to get rid of a lot of that extra dirt. The Napa cabbage was born and raised in Northern China. The such record of this Napa cabbage was in early Chinese texts in 500 AD. But presumably, the Napa cabbage is known before. Okay, so you, you wanted to like trim a fair amount of the cabbage off because we're not going to use the whole head. We typically just want to use like half of it. And once you have half the head, then we can start cutting it into smaller pieces. 
and you don't want the pieces too big because they are going in dumplings and dumplings are pretty small. So you want to make the cabbage really fine. This looks like too much cabbage right now. So what I'm probably gonna do is I'm gonna eye it when I add the meat. So we'll play it by ear. Another fact about Napa cabbage is it was introduced in, into North America when the second and third generations of Chinese populations in the US and Canada began to rise. Okay, the next ingredient is scallions. So traditional onions, not scallions, originally came from what is assumed to be Persia or modern day Iran. And the oldest record of bulbous onions comes from Egypt. They typically used those onions to decorate Egyptian tombs. It was strictly ornamental. Oddly enough, the bulbous onion was considered taboo in Asia, um, in Buddhism and Hinduism religions. Now, the spring onion or the scallion, uh, the, earl the earliest record of it comes from 400 AD in China where they used the scallion to treat dysentery, fever, and, um, and headaches. Do you wanna do another fact? Yeah. Come read the paper. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wait, what's, what's the... Uh... What's, the, what's my line? Action. The next ingredient. Shiitake sliced mushrooms. The earliest record of shiitake mushrooms was when the Japanese emperor, Cha, was offered shiitake mushrooms on a dish in 199 AD by the Kyushu natives. Where are the Kyushu natives from? The Kyushu natives are from the shiitake mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> They're from Japan! The shiitake mushrooms were native in Japan. The Japanese cultivated the shiitake mushrooms and later put them in dishes such as dumplings. You kind of want just everything to be nice and fine on the ground when you're cutting up some of these mushrooms. So it's kind of hard to pinpoint where exactly like a lot of spices come from, um, but we do know roughly when and where those spices came from. A lot of the archaeology data kind of gets skewed because of the vast expanse of the spice trade. I'm going to add one teaspoon of ginger. Um, ginger comes from Southeast Asia, originates around 2000 BC. We're going to add two tablespoons of garlic. Minced garlic. That looks good. Da, da, da. One more. And finita. Earliest cultivation of garlic was in Central Asia around 2000 BC. Very interesting. Thank you for that cool fact. Yes, and if you would like to know more information, I will have to spend more time looking at your paper. So, in soy sauce, one of the ingredients is soy, and soy comes from Southeast Asia, but it's one of those things that gets lost in the archaeological record. Soy sauce comes from Southeast Asia, but it, its earliest cultivation is unknown. Okay, so we're gonna add four teaspoons of soy sauce. Nine. Perfect. It's a little more than four. So another ingredient in soy sauce is wheat. And today, 35% of the world is fed off of wheat. And it was first cultivated close to 10,000 years ago. It was one of the first uh, crops to be domesticated. And it comes from the Mediterranean. And it soon quickly spread because people realized that it could be grown in the cold north, by the equator, uh, in the tropics. It could be grown virtually anywhere and everywhere and it grew quickly, easily, and cheaply. So wheat spreads to Europe, uh, Britain, around 3500 BC. Uh, even before that, it was in Northern Africa, around Egypt in 5000 BC. But what we're more interested in with is when does it get to China? So it gets to China around 4000 BC 
and it lingers around there until we get our Chinese dumplings in 280. Another ingredient in soy sauce is salt. Um, and sodium chloride salt, it was mined uh, in China in 2000 BC. So we can assume that that's how we got our salt in our soy sauce, which eventually gets put into our pot stickers. In the pre-Columbian Americas, Salt was traded by the Aztecs and the Mayas for food, medicine, and religious purposes. So salt throughout the history of the world, uh, it's pretty much been available everywhere, but not as available as water, which water is also another ingredient in soy sauce. I think it's pretty self-explanatory how uh, the Chinese were able to obtain water, particularly fresh water, because you can't survive without it. So all of history, all of past civilizations, they had to have survived with some sort of access and means to fresh water. Now we are going to add two tablespoons of sesame oil. That's one, and that's 12. Perfect. The sesame oil is extracted from the sesame seed. It's impressive, excruciatingly incredible. Now let's move on to the next sentence. China dates back to the time of Jesus Christ, where the sesame was- China, China dates back to the time of Jesus Christ? You said China dates back to the time of Jesus Christ. China dates back to the time of Jesus Christ. The earliest record of sesame in China dates back to the time of Jesus Christ, where sesame was brought in from the West during the Han Dynasty, presumably from the Silk Road. I would prefer to call it Silky Road, but you get my point. The next ingredient is sherry. Um, we're just gonna add two tablespoons. So sherry actually has like an interesting history. It was developed in the 13th century as a result of the Ottoman Empire destroying Malmsey vineyards in England uh, during the Crusades. So English merchants were in search of a new wine for England, and they found it in southern Spain in a town called Sherry's. And in Cherries, they made a wine called Sack. And those English merchants were able to trade Sack back to England. And the term Sherry actually comes from a mispronunciation of the town where Sack comes from, Cherries. It actually comes from Cherries Berries online, Google it. And in the 15th century, uh, Christopher Columbus winds up bringing Sherry along with him on his maiden voyages to the Americas. But Typically, this is not an ingredient used in Asian dishes. I like to use it just because I've grown up with it. Um, and also, I don't have sake. We are going to now do two tablespoons of black pepper. One, 95. The time of oldest cultivation of black peppercorn was first discovered in the tropics of Southeast Asia. And that was in the prehistoric time of India. Uh, I prefer putting pork into my dumplings. However, you can add chicken or no meat as well. The earliest cultivation of uh, the domesticated wild boar actually dates back to 8,000 BC in Turkey. It's assumed that the domestication of the pig predates the domestication of wheat. The domestication of the pig in China uh, actually doesn't occur until 4,000 BC. And according to uh, the Chinese government, they actually claim that they first domesticated the, uh, the pig, which leads to some contradictions in the historical record. Although it, it is still possible that the domestication of the pig occurred in different places at different times, uh, independent from one another. So this is one pound of pork, um, it's ground pork. I'm gonna add it to the mixture of our veggies and our spices. And I'm not gonna mix it with a spoon or anything. I'll, I'll actually wanna mix it with my hands. So make sure you wash your hands. So I don't make my own pot sticker wrappers. I just go to the grocery store and I buy them. Um, I got these from Wegmans. Uh, and typically there's 30 to 40 wrappers inside of them. Uh, the, the ingredients of these is just flour, salt, and water. Um, and flour is made from wheat, and we've already discussed wheat. So when making the wrappers, 
You want to have like a bowl of water just to wet your fingertips, just to um, so when you close up the the dumpling, you want the the edges to stick to each other. So you grab your spaceship <laughs> saucer. <laughs> Got this filling here, just a little, just a little, just a little. That's probably good enough. Take a little dab, dab. Come here. Get all the edges. Then all you can do is wrap up from the center, and then press and fold. We could add it a little more meat, but. They're all done. Now, we usually run into this problem where we still have a little bit extra. I wouldn't worry about it. I usually just toss it, but if you really want to make use of it, you could probably buy some more wrappers or make some more wrappers and just try to utilize the most of that. We're gonna fry the dumplings with canola oil. Canola oil actually is extracted from the rapeseed plant and the rapeseed plant was, the earliest known cultivation of it was in India around 3000 years ago and it doesn't get introduced to China uh, until the time of Christ, so around 2,000 years ago. How it got to America was it was traded to Europe around the 13th century, and then it made it to the Americas through the Columbian Exchange. Uh, initially, it was used for oil lamps or industrial lubrication. Uh, interestingly, modern day, uh, the U.S. makes a lot of canola oil. Uh, however, uh, we get most of our imports from Canada. Due to this large import, uh, the name rapeseed oil, which understandably was changed to canola oil and canola standing for Canada oil low acid. Okay, so ultimately you just wanna wait for them to get uh, brown on the bottom, brown on the sides, uh, just to get it a little crispy. And then you wanna add in a little bit of water uh, to kind of steam them and then you're gonna cook that for about two minutes. Okay, so at this point, they look pretty good. You just wanna crisp the outside, but the meat on the inside is uh, still uncooked, so you have to steam it just to cook uh, the dumplings all the way through. So we're gonna add a little bit of water and then cover it for about two minutes. And at this point, you just wanna keep it on medium low heat. Uh, you don't really wanna uh, keep frying the, the outside or else they'll become too tough and too crisp. Okay, so it's been two minutes. We can take off the lid and you just wanna leave them on here for just about another two minutes until most of that water uh, has evaporated. And just kinda of flip them around some more just to get the edges uh, nicely crisp like they were before you added the water. All right, so all the water is evaporated. The edges are nicely crisp, so we're done and we can serve. So now that we're done, you just need a dipping sauce. And what better dipping sauce than just plain soy sauce? If you have any more dumplings left over, you can still uh, package them up in a Ziploc bag and freeze them. 